All right, welcome back. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stephen Ross from New York, who's going to talk about psychedelics and cancer-related psychiatric distress. Uh, please take the stage. Thank you. Okay, well, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I wanted to thank the uh, Swedish Psychedelic Group for inviting me here. I think it's great that, um, that this is starting to happen in different places uh, in Europe. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, the history of using psychedelic-assisted therapy to treat cancer patients that have psychological distress and existential distress. And I'm going to talk about uh, some work that we did at NYU uh, that has been part of that. Um, this is where I receive uh, research funding. Uh, even though you'll see there is funding from the NIH, none of it is for psychedelic research. So in the US, although the FDA and the DEA will give approval to do psychedelic studies, the NIH has yet to fund it. They did in the 50s and 60s, several million dollars, the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, and we think we're at the point now where we're able to get the NIH to start funding uh, these trials. So I'm going to talk, I did a systematic review of the literature. Um, and I'm going to talk about the prevalence of cancer and then talk about the adverse effects of cancer from a psychological and um, existential and medical perspectives. And then I'm going to, we're going to look at the evidence-based treatments for uh, cancer-related distress in terms of the pharmacologic and psychosocial treatments. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how people die in America. Um, I'm not sure how it is in Europe, but we die pretty bad deaths in the U.S. And the U.S. medical system is really not geared to help people die. We're, you know, geared to sort of like save people. And uh, so part of this study really is to kind of a help occasion a, a better way of dying. So I'll mention the historical research, and then I'll talk about the resumption of research since uh, the early 2000s. And then we'll look into the future and see what's next, because there's some things coming up pretty quickly in the future that may be very interesting for the field of, of psychiatry. So um, this was a review article. Matt Johnson invited me to, uh, to do this. And so you know, this was, uh, I was familiar with this literature, but it's always great to really review a topic. And so I went through everything uh, in this topic, uh, and it was a systematic review. It was looking at classical psychedelics to treat cancer-related psychiatric distress. The time period was 1960 to the modern era. These were the sources uh, that was used. We adhere to PRISMA guidelines, which has to do with guidelines that have to do with systematic uh, reviews and meta-analytic meta reviews. The, uh, we restricted the search to clinical trials that were either open label or randomized control trials. Uh, and there was a similar um, meta-analysis done by Rachel in 2018 that was published a couple months before. There's actually a lot of meta-analyses coming out about this topic, and our methodology was similar to theirs. So I found 11 clinical trials. There was um, 445 participants. Uh, so it was a fairly large number of people that have received this treatment. It's not on par with alcoholism. Uh, you've seen some slides about the use of psychedelics to treat psychiatric disorders. By far, the most studied indication is alcoholism, several thousand participants. But um, terminal cancer-related distress is, is second. So there were six open-label trials um, from the, the early research era. And before they could go to randomized controlled trials, the music stopped. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But there was a lot of open-label data that was highly suggestive of a treatment effect in various ways. And then in the modern era, we really took the baton from that research and um, at a bunch of places, including UCLA, Charlie Grobe here, um, Johns Hopkins and NYU, we sort of like worked together and we, we had sort of similar designs and I'll, I'll go over those trials in great detail. All but two of the trials were exclusively in cancer. Uh, Eric Kast did uh, work with uh, severe burn patients and Peter Gasser in Switzerland. And his trial included people that um, did not have cancer and had other forms of terminal illness. And you can see by far the most studied indication historically, or the most studied drug was LSD, followed by psilocybin. And there was one trial of uh, DPT that was done at Spring Grove by, um, by Bill Richards. So cancer is, um, is a horrible thing. Um, you know, it's highly common in the world. Um, it's the second leading cause of global disability uh, in the U.S. Um, about 40% of the population will receive a cancer diagnosis at some point. And um, it's one of these horrifying things. You're going along in your life and suddenly, you know, you're told you have cancer. And the patients in our 
trial, there's a sort of spectrum of responsivity, and I'll go through that, but the ones we treated were demoralized, frightened, um, disconnected from all sources of meaning and felt horrible, wanted to sort of get it over with and die already. So uh, cancer is a, is a frightening thing. Um, Okay, so, and it's also there is very common to have psychiatric disorders associated with cancer. Um, people can develop major depression, they can develop ex anxiety spectrum phenomena, they can have adjustment disorders, and that was the majority of the patients we saw in our trial had adjustment disorders, and the prevalence can be as high as 30 to, to 40 percent. And having psychiatric distress, being depressed and anxious, is associated with a whole host of adverse psychological uh, and medical problems. So your quality of life goes down, social uh, function goes down, you, know, you don't take your meds, you go to the hospital more often, and you have this hastened desire to want to be dead. You just feel demoralized and you wish that you could go to sleep and not wake up. There's a, a heightened rate of suicide in this population, they're vulnerable uh, to that. Um, and they have adverse medical outcomes, and they have decreased survival from cancer. So. You know, it may be the psychological state of mind, the immune system, ability to fight cancer, you know, can be linked to each other. So it's interesting to consider that, you know, untreated psychiatric distress can actually cause someone to die sooner. Um, and in terms of evidence-based treatments, there's medications used in psychotherapies, but there's really no established algorithm of care. Um, and the, the efficacy of the medications and the psychotherapy is, is limited. We heard a little bit about PTSD. The medicines for PTSD work very poorly. So this is another like illness within psychiatry where we really don't have great treatments. There have been some meta-analyses of uh, randomized controlled trials of antidepressants for cancer-related distress, and they show that the, the medications work no better than uh, placebo. Uh, and in one of the meta-analyses where they looked at antidepressants and other co-occurring illnesses, th there was um, a treatment effect of the experimental versus the placebo for things like um, AIDS-related illness or post-stroke. But if you looked at terminal cancer, it was no better than placebo. It was about a 40% placebo rate. And I want you to keep the 40% in mind because when I present our data, we'll, we'll take a look at um, sort of how the placebo group um, squared out. So what is existential distress? For those in medicine that um, treat patients that are terminally ill or addiction, we see this sort of like existential uh, crisis. So cancer, um, people respond differently to it. Some people think it's a gift. It's a gift that allows them to create meaning. It allows them to not focus on things that are worthless. And they really like make the most out of their cancer. I find it remarkable, the people that respond like that. Um, then you have other people that cope through denial. You know, no, I'm going to be okay. You know, I'll get through this, whatever. And then you have about a third of people that have this very bad response, this sort of existential distress. Um, and this has to do with demoralization, feeling hopeless, feeling that you have no power, that life has no purpose or meaning. You've lost your dignity. Things are futile. You're isolated. And you've lost the ability to connect to love, hope, um, connection within yourself, connection to a broader community, connection to a spiritual uh, entity and sort of an uh, organization. Um, and when you have existential distress in cancer, similar to having psychological distress, it's bad for you too. So you're more anxious, you're more depressed, hasten desire to want to die. Increased rates of suicidality, um, your pain is worse, you have worse healthcare visits, and your quality of life uh, goes down. And there's this construct of um, hasten desire for death um, you know, pre-suicide. Pre and cancer does have an elevated rate of, of suicide, about two-fold risk to not having it, um, even though it's still a relatively rare phenomenon within cancer. But this hastened desire for death phenomena is something that we, we try to pay attention to. And it can be upwards of a quarter of individuals that have more terminal variants of cancer. And you can see that um, when they've sort of done correlation, spiritual well-being uh, is correlated with hasten desire for death, so lower spiritual well-being, higher hasten desire for death, uh, more depression, more hopelessness, higher uh, desire for hasten death. And we're going to come back to these because we measured these in the trial that that we did. Um, so improved existential well-being. Th these are associations. These are not from sort of causal studies, but there is an association if you can improve this sort of existential spiritual domain that people's quality of life gets better. They're less depressed less hopeless, less hastened desire to want to die. So the, the field of existential psychology actually came from existential philosophy. You had people like Kierkegaard and Sartre, um, and they, uh, I think Sartre actually was an existential philosopher, and then he became a psychologist. He, I think he was the first existential psychologist. And then you have 
Viktor Frankl up here, who was um, a Viennese um, Holocaust survivor. He spent time in the Holocaust. We've heard about his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, and the idea there that, you know, in these concentration camps, people that sort of gave up, my life is over, you know, demoralized, they died sooner. But the people that made meaning of it and even found humor in what was happening to them were able to get through the Holocaust in a better way. And afterwards, he, he returned to Vienna and he developed this local therapy, this meaning-making psychotherapy. And Dr. Gus, um, where is Dr. Gus? Dr. Gus talked about it earlier in terms of the local therapy. So um, when we were thinking about our psychotherapeutic platform, we picked these existentially oriented treatments. And there have been other ones. Um, this is uh, Dame Cecile Saunders. She was the founder of the modern hospice movement. And then you have a bunch of psychologists. This is Abraham Maslow. Irving Yalom, and there's a bunch of um, psycho-oncologists that have developed psychotherapies, existentially oriented psychotherapies, and some of them have an evidence base to them, and we drew from some of those for our trial. But there um, are no pharmacologic treatments for this existential typology of distress. Uh, it does not exist. Okay, so where do people want to die? Who would like to die in an ICU? Raise your hand. Occasionally, I once gave a lecture, and the world's near-death expert, um, he raised his hand because he, you know, he does research in, uh, in ICU, so he was, he was the only one. But most people know, who wants to die in a nursing home? How about a home hospice with your family surrounding you? And uh, Yeah, so I, I think most people would want to do that, but in America, this is how most people die. Most people die in... In ICUs, in, in the U.S., we spend more money in the last several years of life than any other country. We are obsessed with save them, give them more. You know, our, our system is sort of like dis, disaligned. And we really don't do a good job of saying it's time to stop and to get the, you know, help the person really have a good death. Uh, this is in 93, so it's a little bit old. It's actually gotten better. But you can see the majority of people are dying in hospitals, nursing homes. It's not quite that bad now. It's more like about a third of people now die in, in hospital settings, but when you ask patients where do you want to die, they're not, they don't want to die in the ICU, they want to die at home. So we're, we really, um, you know, patients are, are, you know, dying bad deaths. And when you ask patients what's the most important thing now that you're dying, they cite existential needs, um, meaning, purpose, you know, hope, forgiveness, relationships with family and friends, wanting to be more connected to their spiritual entity, thoughts of death and dying. But in medicine, I was taught zero about this, not a single, single lecture. So doctors, we don't know how to help patients. Um, we don't even like know how to make referrals. So we really are not helping our patients um, from this perspective. So what would a good death look like? Uh, it's interesting in our trial, one of the first things we do with the cancer patients before we dose them is we do a full life review. We go into their lives in great detail. Who's done that recently? You know, gone back and looked at your life with a fine tooth comb and really, you know, yeah, it's good. But most of us are just hurtling forward, you know, and going and going and to really like take stop and to, to think about, you know, the story and the narrative of your life and its history is very interesting to do. Um, it's important to, you know, manage pain and other kinds of symptoms. Um, people are interested in spirituality and meaning. They want to resolve complex. They want to have a sense of completion in their lives. They want to spend time with their friends and family. They want to make clear decisions. Uh, and they want to prepare, prepare for the end, saying goodbye to people. I've treated too many people where none of this happened. They're just, you know, scared out of their minds, you know, and then, and then they die. And it's really, really horrible. It's really important to, you know, wrap up your life in some way as much as you're able to. Um, so very briefly, we've gotten some of this, the history of psychedelics. Psychedelics have been used by indigenous cultures for millennia. Uh, so we, we didn't invent this, but it was 1943, this accidental discovery of Albert Hoffman uh, of LSD. And then Sandoz, pharmaceutical company, makes LSD. It's you know, sort of the Wild West. Anybody could just order it and get it, and um, they market it as Delhi Sid. But it started this remarkable period of research. Um, and Gordon Wasson went to Mexico, and he was looking for peyote, but he found psilocybin. He sent it back to Albert Hoffman, and he um, isolated the psilocybin molecule in 1958. But it was this huge part of psychiatry, which was fascinating, because when I went through my psychiatric training, I learned zero. No one ever said within psychiatry there was this 25-year period that psychedelics were studied. Nothing. I heard, you know, urban legends, chromosomal damage, or LSD makes you psychotic. And it was only in 2006 when Jeff Goss, who was my supervisor, 
he one day started asking me what I knew about ayahuasca. And I was like, what? You know, I'm a drug expert. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and at that time in 2006, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the UDV could legally use uh, ayahuasca, similar to the Native American church in peyote, but that if you're a U.S. citizen and you're not in this religious group and you use it, you'd go to jail. And I thought, wow, that's very, very strange. And Jeff also said in Switzerland there's the 50th anniversary commemorating the discovery of LSD. I thought, why, why would anybody do that? It was like so strange. And then very quickly... Um, like hidden in plain sight, it was all there. You didn't really need to go too far that this was a big part of psychiatry. And how could it, you know, how could it have been that I, I didn't learn this? So I became very fascinated in a short order in 2006. Jeff and I, Tony Bossis and Alex Belzer formed the NYU. It was first a reading group. We were just going to read some articles. But then um, somebody knew Charlie Grobe. And I had gone to UCLA for medical school. And uh, so one time when I was going to visit my family in L.A., I emailed Charlie, said you should come to Harbor. We spent three hours having Chinese lunch. And I was like, this is a real thing? Yeah, yeah, it's a real, you know. It, Charlie gave me every single tip, you know. Oh, you're a division chief, that's good. Join the IRB. And I said, but, you know, isn't this a career killer? No, no, you'll be fine. How am I going to get any money for this? Ah, he's like, I introduce you to Dave and Hefter, and uh, we'll, we'll help you out. So Charlie was instrumental in sort of lifting our group. And he had a daughter at NYU at the time. And he was like, my daughter goes to NYU. This is just going to work out great. I'm like, okay. And so I went to all of my research mentors, and they were like, no way. This is crazy. There's no money. You definitely don't do this terrible idea. But I think I was too young and dumb and just, you know, uh, and, and persistent. I thought, like, wow, this is too, too interesting to ignore, you know. And so our group, um, we formed, went from the reading group to a research group, the NYU PRG, and we started meeting every Friday, which we've been doing now for 12 years. And we just kept putting one foot in front of the other, and we, uh, Charlie was gracious. He gave us his protocol for psilocybin and cancer, and so we had that. And Again, it was like dumb luck. I just like, well, maybe we'll increase the dose, which we did. And, uh, but essentially, the same design as Charlie's. And I will go through the, the data on that. Um, so it's, it's been a, a very interesting journey the last 12 years. It's very, very difficult. For a long time, I was like, this is crazy. We just have to stop doing this. But something has changed in the last couple of years, and it's getting very exciting. But Richard Nixon was very concerned that psychedelics were being used by um, you know, affluent white people and that they were not going to war and thinking differently. And so he made this decision, this came out later, we're going to shut down the hippies by, going, by using LSD and cannabis. That will shut them down. And heroin was for the blacks. And so the Controlled Substance Act, this came out a little bit later, Lee Atwater, his sort of right-hand man, said this was our strategy. So essentially the Controlled Substance Act and creating the scheduling system, putting all these drugs into Schedule 1, which really shouldn't be there, right? The drugs that should be in Schedule 1 are number one, alcohol, number two, tobacco, but they were absented. And so we created this thing, and not only did it was the war on drugs in the U.S., the, the U.S. coerced the U.N. to export it to the rest of the world. So Sweden is a, is a country that seems to have really sort of uh, kind of adopted this Nixonian policy in a, in a very sort of interesting and strict way. Um, but... The Controlled Substance Act always left the room open to do research, and it was Rick Strauss in the early 90s that got approval to give IV DMT to participants, which is a little bit crazy, the first psychedelic trial to give IV DMT. There was some alien abduction stuff that happened. But anyway, it, and it's interesting that Imperial College now is, is reprising that work with the IV DMT with people in a scanner. I find that super interesting. Um, and so, you know, there were a group of pioneers, Charlie Grobe, Roland Griffiths, Francisco Moreno, University of Arizona. Um, and there was a, a growing group of people. Michael Bogenschutz at the University of New Mexico uh, pioneered the use of psilocybin for alcoholism. And Michael joined our group a couple of years ago, and he's just a real powerhouse. And so our group is, um, you know, really sort of moving forward uh, and collaborating with other groups. So the idea of using psychedelics to help dying people first came from Valentina Wasson. So Gordon Wasson, Valentina Wasson, she was an uh, amateur mycologist. He was a banker. They went looking for psilocybin, and they found it, and Wasson was the first American to receive um, the psilocybin session. This is Maria Sabina uh, at the time. But Valentina Wasson said, I think psychedelics can help dying people. 
Aldous Huxley did too as well. Aldous Huxley was a big believer in the use of psychedelics to help a dying. So much so that when he was dying, he had his wife Laura administer 100 micrograms of LSD intramuscular to help facilitate his death. Uh, but then the, the real research with that I'm, I'm going to get into next, and here's Eric Kast and Stan Groff, Walter Pankey, and Sidney Cohen at UCLA. Um, so the Eric Kast story, and then I'm going to talk about the Spring Grove story. So Cast was this really amazing guy. He was at the University of Chicago. He was both a psychiatrist and an internal medicine doctor, and he was a pain specialist. And he heard about this LSD drug, and he thought, I'm going to order some over from Sandoz, and I'm going to try it on my dying terminally ill cancer patients, you know, as a pain medicine. Knew nothing about its psychological effects, nothing about set and setting, preparation, anything. He would, like, just come up to them and say, uh, okay, like, stick out your tongue, here's your LSD, and I'll, I'll check you later, you know, have a good, have a good day, which is kind of crazy to think that he, he did that, but I think he was such a beloved doctor that um, in his first trial, um, you know, that, that worked. His later trials, he actually developed more of the set and setting model. So there were three papers published um, by him. The first was a comparative efficacy trial of LSD to opiate pharmacotherapies, hydromorphone and meperidine. And there were 50 patients with severe pain syndromes, not just cancer, there were also burns and other kinds of problems, infections, and what he found was acutely, um, all three groups acutely within the first several hours. You know, opiates we know acutely work for pain, but he found the LSD group had an acute reduction in pain. But what was interesting is he found this sort of longer tail that as the, the opiates started to come up in terms of their pain, the LSD group stayed down for a couple weeks. This was single dose. So he was he thought, how is it that this drug could have sustained you know, anti-nociception. Anti uh, in the modern era, it would be interesting to look at that again um, for chronic pain conditions. But in addition to the analgesia, he also noticed these people were less depressed, their sleep got better, and they had a decreased fear of death. And he thought, okay, uh, I'm onto something here. So he extended his work, and it was all open label, no control. He, everybody was terminally ill, um, and he gave it to over 200 people. One publication in 66, another in 67. And his model shifted a little bit. He started to realize there's something special about this drug. It wasn't quite the Spring Grove, you know, Stan Groff model yet, but it was we need to prepare them, we need to make the room nice, if somebody needs to be with them, we need to do some integration afterwards. So he went from a pure pharmacologic, only chemotherapeutic model to, you know, more of what we would think would be the best practice model in terms of set setting and Preparation. What he found, again, is decreased pain acutely and in a sustained way over several weeks from single dosing, decreased depression, increased morale, increased sleep, decreased fear of death. And patients were saying, I'm having these like interesting philosophical insights, and they reported mystical experiences. Okay, so this is the Spring Grove group, and that's... Um, Stan Groff and Bill Richards. Bill Richards really is like the sort of link between the old research and the current research. Johns Hopkins, that was Walter Pankey. Spring Grove was like where the dream team of psychedelics converged. Uh, there was this amazing uh, team there, and they, they started out um, studying addiction, but what happened is one of the nurses developed a terminal breast cancer, and one of the psychologists, Sidney Wolf, said, you know, why don't we try you know, the treatment of LSD for her and see if we can shift to the terminal ill, which they did. And that open-label trials, all terminally ill cancer patients, most of them were African-American homeless gentlemen, like 70%. So this was really the only psychedelic study that included minorities in a significant way. It was federally funded. There were 83 participants. 53 got high-dose LSD. And then there was 30 that got I intramuscular DPT. They did a sub-analysis on 31 of the participants. Um, I'll get to that in a sec. But their inclusion criteria is essentially the same as what we did in the modern era. People, except, you know, in our trial, we included people that, um, you know, had more than three months. So anxiety and depression, excluding people with major psychiatric illness, you do not want to give these drugs to people with psychotic spectrum illness. I know there's a lecture going on now um, about using ayahuasca for severe bipolar disorder, so it's, it's interesting to consider, but we want to make sure anyone that is actively psychotic or at risk for psychosis, you definitely want to rule them out. We ruled out people with... Uh, CNS illness, and then they did as well. And this is all the things that they measured, essentially what we measured in the modern era. Again, it was like picking up the baton in a way. Same thing, preparations, male-female dyads, rapport building, 
and again, a lot of this is being changed now. So why does it should be male, female? That's like sort of upsetting to a lot of people. So I, a lot of this is like fungible. We don't know. They use music. We don't really know if that's the most important thing, but we continue to do it. They included family members. I mean, they really did a good job here. Um, and they had uh, integration afterwards. And what they found pre-post, this was not a control group, was decreased depression, decreased anxiety, and decreased fear of death. And I think their next thing was they were going to do a control trial, but they never got a chance to do that. Um, and what they found, the global improvements, about a third of people dramatically improved, 23% unimproved, another 42 moderately improved. So what happened next is psychedelics escaped from the laboratory. Timothy Leary was the Pied Piper of psychedelics. He became the most dangerous man in America, according to Richard Nixon, and everything went crazy. You know, it escaped from the lab, and American uh, youth started using it in you know, reckless and indiscriminate ways, and it created problems, and Richard Nixon had to... Uh, well, he used it to really shut the whole thing down, and um, we're dealing with that historical moment to this day. But it has been brought back. Um, so in the early 2000s to the present, um, there, were, uh, there was one trial in Switzerland using LSD, and there were three trials in the US using psilocybin, and that was Charlie Grobe at UCLA, Roland Griffiths at Hopkins, and our team at, at NYU. We all used psilocybin. Uh, and the methodologies were all what you would want in the modern era in terms of you know, having specific uh, standardized diagnoses, severity measures, having a placebo control, and we can debate an active control uh, versus others. And to standardize the psychotherapy, we really think this is medication-assisted psychotherapy. And so that was really our model, and to sort of like try to uh, create a dose of the psychotherapy. You need objective blind raters, and you need good follow-up. Um, the Peter Gasser trial, uh, the design, it was a randomized control trial. There were 12 participants. It was a preparation, dosing, integration. The crossover was at two months. The experimental group was single-dose LSD. The active control was low-dose LSD, which is interesting. Uh, the MAPS trials as well, they've used sort of low-dose MDMA for their phase two trials. And no serious adverse events. And you found at the two-month point, using the stay anxiety measure, there were significant between group differences with the experimental group having more, more sustained reductions in anxiety. And he did a 12-month follow-up study, and uh, you can see here that's two months, and uh, that's statistically significant uh, difference. That's the state part of the stay, and then the trait part of it, which is a more enduring part of anxiety, also decreased and was significant at two months. Um, and then they also looked at 12 months later, and the effects were sustained at 12 months. And that's a recurring theme that single dose of these uh, compounds leads to sustained effects. And, and not you know, a week or so like you see with ketamine, but months, many months. So these, this was a, sort of an attempt at three sites. And this was uh, you know, really interesting and we were proud to have, you know, usually universities compete with each other, but we really have worked together. We think you can get so much far, farther by collaborating. Uh, so I'll talk about UCLA, the Hopkins, the NYU trial. The similarities, they were all double blind. They all included randomization. They all had an active control, um, somewhat different. All used validated outcome measures. All of them was just one dose of uh, psilocybin versus placebo, and it was a moderate to high dose. There was a crossover methodology. You know, ideally you'd want a parallel design because after the crossover, you can't attribute the improvements to psilocybin. So we're going to need to replicate these studies and have a parallel design without a crossover. Um, it's really important to exclude people, as I mentioned, with psychosis or unstable psychiatric disorders. It could be severe borderline personality disorder. Uh, as well. You want to rule out serious medical pathology. So these were not people, you know, that had end-stage liver disease or, you know, they, they were sort of stable medically despite the fact that some of them were dying of cancer. You need the, and we all had the optimal setting and you've seen the rooms and the diet therapy teams. The variance between them was dose. UCLA used a lower dose. The FDA was cautious and so they had to start at a lower dose, which probably affected the uh, effect size and we'll get into that. We uh, picked a higher dose, which sort of dumb luck ended up being a, 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 you know, a more therapeutic dose. Hopkins, about the same. The active control, UCLA and NYU used niacin, 250 milligrams, which gives you a tingly feeling, makes you feel like maybe something's going on. And JHU used low-dose psilocybin. In terms of terminally ill, the UCLA study was 100% terminally ill patients. We started out that way, but we got a lot of patients saying, 
you know, I'm not dying, but I'm scared out of my mind, you know. So we thought, okay, having cancer, you know, you don't have to be dying to be scared. So we broadened it to include other people, um, and Hopkins did as well. In terms of the type of psychiatric distress, our study in the UCLA one was mostly anxiety. It was really cancer-related anxiety and a little bit of depression. And Hopkins was more of a mix of depression uh, and anxiety. And, and you've seen these lovely people here. And now, the original room at the GCRC at UCLA looked like a typical hospital-looking room. Like, you don't want it to look like that. And at UCLA, they, you know, they did that. So those were the early days. You just throw up some tie-dye and... Uh, um, but you wanted to make it look different then. Because some of the early psychedelic studies, very drab, put the person in a basement, give them LSD, put them in a posy restraint, you know, you know. You, that's, that's not a good idea. So this was um, published in the, the archives of general psychiatry um, at the time, now JAMA Psychiatry, very prestigious journal. Uh, it was people 36 to 58, 12. It was essentially all women. And Charlie was able to demonstrate it's feasible to do this. It was safe. There were no major cardiovascular events, no adverse, no major uh, adverse psychological events, no severe anxieties, uh, no uh, serious adverse events, no need to give anyone medication. Nobody needed to be hospitalized. Nobody became addicted. And uh, this is essentially what you're finding out in all of these studies. This is a very safe drug to give to people, especially if you take care of the psychological uh, vulnerabilities. Charlie found that psilocybin induced mystical experiences and there were efficacy signals uh, for anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. This was the APZ scale that Charlie used and, and you can see that um, there were big differences between the psilocybin group versus the placebo. Um, and you can see here there were trends. So uh, this was uh, the anxiety measure and you can see here um, at six hours afterwards there's a separation. It's not statistically significant um, but you can get a sense that there's like a separation, that you're having greater reduction in anxiety pre-crossover in, um, in the experimental group. Uh, and same here with the, um, the trait anxiety. You know, they're separating, but they're not statistically significant because it's, you know, underpowered by uh, sample size and by dose probably as well. But you are seeing these significant pre-post changes. This is at one month. Um, and at three months, and Charlie showed this data. So some sustained effect, we just don't know what to attribute that to. Depression as well, you can see a separation. It's not significant, but it's suggestive. It, you can see pre-post at six months, there's a sustained antidepressant um, effect. So our group um, at NYU, uh, so December 1st, our group published this paper, and the Hopkins group published a paper at the same time. And um, it got a lot of uh, press at the time, and there were a lot of psychiatrists that wrote editorials about it. Um, we, in terms of the design, there was a, up to a month of pretreatment. This was getting to know their life in great detail, doing a life review, um, preparing, and then you know getting to know cancer in great detail, how it negatively affected their lives, preparing them for the psychedelic session. We measured their distress one day before, and we measured it one day after, which is important because I'll get into the data there in terms of the rapidity of the effects. It was either psilocybin, 0.3 milligrams, or niacin, and then there was seven weeks, and then there was a crossover at that point, so the, the groups crossed over, and then there was another 26 weeks, so the final out point was six and a half months post-dosing. And we, you know, initially it was gonna be for terminally ill, but we included people that have at least one life, one year of life, Anxiety disorders, adjustment disorders, generalized anxiety. These were the, uh, the diagnoses that we, we used. We excluded people that were, you know, really medically ill and dying in terms of things going on with their heart or lungs or kidneys. We excluded psychiatric medications that may interfere with the effects of psilocybin and other medicines. We, you know, really went carefully to exclude a major mental illness, severe bipolar disorder and psychosis. And if anyone, if there was a significant family history, we excluded people. With that, even if they were 50, 60, and it's very unlikely they're going to develop schizophrenia, we wanted to be very careful. No active addiction, um, and we looked at anxiety and depression as the primary outcome. The secondary were spiritual measures, quality of life, and these existential distress uh, validated measures. And again, we view this as medication assisted psychotherapy. We think that the change can occur potentially on multiple levels. Um, cognitive, psychodynamic, it really was helpful to have a, a psychoanalyst and Jeff as, uh, as part of the treatment because 
you know, Freud was looking to the royal road, to the unconscious. He thought it was dreams. And I, I think psychedelics are a more royal road that they really get into unconscious material in an interesting way, uh, similar to dreams, perhaps. And so we, we really drew from all these different psychotherapeutic models as our platform. It took two years just to get the schedule and license. It was very, very laborious. Anyone that's doing this research has to be extremely persistent. And I think if you're persistent, you know, you can eventually get there. Cause... So the, the FDA is, is great. They're very open-minded about this. And, um, you know, they, they were pretty on board early on. I had to go through an uh, oncology ethical review board. They were super skeptical. And they were like, no, this is... And we almost got voted down. It almost didn't get... It was like two months into the project. And um, I had to pull the head of the group. This was actually Charlie's advice. Because Charlie, we're getting destroyed here. It's never... He said, meet with the head of the group ahead of time and just kind of, you know, sweet talk him and whatever. So I met with the guy and he's like, it's not looking good. And I'm like, well, we, uh, you know, what can we do? And, and he, he sort of came around. And um, in the end, there were 11 oncologists and he finally forced a vote. It, and um, so he said, how many people in favor? Like two hands go up. He puts his hands up. It's like five hands that go up. And then, okay, this is not going to work out. But then two said no, one abstained, and the rest just didn't vote. So we got through that committee. That was the sort of the, the place that almost killed us. The Institutional Review Board at NYU approved it, and our Science Institute approved it. The problem is my hospital, Bellevue Hospital, said, we love you. You may have been here a long time, but we're definitely not letting you dose minority individuals with a psychedelic who are dying. Bellevue does not want to end up in the newspaper, and it was, it was upsetting. But out of the blue, the College of Dentistry came to our rescue. I didn't even know we had a College of Dentistry, but it turns out we did. These crazy dentists were like, yeah, we could do that. It's okay. Um, in fact, the head of the dental school was actually dying of terminal lung cancer at the time. He had a non-small cell cancer. He was a non-smoker, so he, he, he was highly sympathetic. The dean told me later, if it weren't for that, it, we, we probably would not have done it. So we got very lucky. It was some strange serendipity. And um, I've uh, been running our substance abuse division for a long time, so I'm used to working with the DEA. They did a background check on me, and they said, you know, as long as you do not sell the drug on the street, we're okay with that. <laughs> okay, I'll definitely not do that. So I think this is the only study that ever took place at a dental school. I can say that. So uh, that's, and you know, dentistry is important. You need to keep, you know, keep your teeth clean and floss, and so <laughs> we'll talk about that later. So you've seen the room. Um, it's a living room-like setting. You make it look nice. You get all the tchotchkes, as Jeff says, you know, some suggestive ones. Um, but it was really cool putting this room together, taking it from like a hospital-looking room and, and having this sort of collectively people come and, and add to it. So in the end, um, it took a decade to do this trial, but we were able to recruit 29 individuals, um, 15 to experimental, 14 to the placebo group. They were mostly... Uh, because Bellevue wouldn't let us recruit from the hospital, which is a hospital for minority individuals, we had to go to the NYU Clinical Cancer Center, which is, you know, filled with Caucasian individuals. So th our trial was mostly white women, um, was the predominant demographic. And most of them, the common patient was a woman with a gynecologic cancer, you know, breast, ovarian, who had metastatic illness, who was dying, who was in their 50s, who had never done psychedelics. That was our typical patient. And they heard about this study and said, I would never think I would do that, but, you know, I, I, I can't stand living like this. So they were very brave. From an adverse perspective, we had mild elevations in blood pressure, which psilocybin can do, but it's not cardiovascularly significant. We have transient anxiety. And you had, we had some people that, you know, had um, kind of like paranoia, uh, that remit. So even people that don't have underlying psychosis, you really got to make sure that, you know, you have to expect that there'll be transient anxiety and maybe some other alterations of consciousness, and you really want to help people through that. But there were no SAEs, no medical or psychiatrical. Okay. And from a cardiovascular perspective, it's the two groups separate nice and actually low is blood pressure. But the max systolic was 140 or so, diastolic you know, was was around 80 or so in heart rate, you know. So these are all like within normal realm. So it does increase a little bit, but nothing too terrible. But what we found is one dose of psilocybin, it was an acute acting anxiolytic. So one day afterwards, you can see there's a separation between the two groups. The psilocybin is the purple one below. And um, 
and seven weeks later, so th this, this was a, a big finding because in psychiatry we have ketamine works right away, degrades after a week, but a pharmacologic agent that is an acute anxiolytic that lasts for seven weeks um, was, was you know, interesting because that's new. Um, same thing on these other anxiety measures. And same for depression. You know, acute antidepressant effects sustained at seven weeks. Um, and these are the effect sizes. Alicia was talking about very large effects. These are very large effect sizes. These are all like over one up to 1.7. These are huge magnitude effects. For an FDA-approved medicine like Zoloft, all you need is 0 0.3 effect size of the experimental versus placebo. So these are very large effects that the FDA looked at and said, okay, this is exciting. There's like something happening here. And okay, so the crossover afterwards, we, don't, we can't attribute the drug, but so one day after getting it, and six and a half months later, you can see the distress is down. So th this to me was an even more interesting thing. Six and a half month enduring anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. We're about to publish our long-term follow-up paper of three years, and, and all of the distress scores are the same. They're all this low. So, you know, three years later, we've had people, and which is hard to believe, and it's a small sample, and we should be skeptical. But if you speak to the patients, they say, yeah, that, you know, bad feeling was gone by the end of the day, and it's never come back, which is, you know, including patients who died and said that they approached their death with, with more peace. And this is another measure in terms of response and remission rates. So one day after the psilocybin group in purple, 80% of them are responding, only like 20% of the placebo, meaning they're having um, you know, more than 50% reduction in the BDI uh, and another um, score on that below a certain cutoff. Uh, same thing in seven weeks. It's sustained. Um, and you know, after the crossover, the two groups look the same. And this is remission rates. So one day after getting it, 80% are in remission. They remain in remission at, uh, at seven weeks. It looks like they remain in remission at 26 weeks. So this is also another way of looking at um, the data in terms of response and remission rates. And we saw it also for anxiety. Um, psilocybin also led to decreases in these existential distress domains before the crossover um, in terms of hopelessness, demoralization. It improved spiritual well-being. It improved quality of life. Um, interestingly, patients said, I'm no longer scared of dying. We thought, we're definitely going to see an anti-death anxiety. But this is like when you observe something and you actually look at the data, there's a difference. So we did not see reductions in death anxiety. We did have a scale that measured cognition attitudes towards death. It, this did get better, um, but we didn't have you know, the, the effect we thought was there. And so we really need more research because going after the domain of death anxiety is, would be, a, I think, a big deal. Um, we've asked people how significant the experience was, and 70% said it was the singular top five most meaningful experience of their lives, 52 top five singular most spiritual, and 87 attributed you know, well-being to the experience. I think somebody has shown this earlier. Um, we um, were able to show that psilocybin-induced mystical experience. This was the MEQ that somebody was talking about later, and there was a correlation between um, scores on the MEQ and reductions in anxiety and depression seven weeks later. And you've um, also seen this mediation analysis. We did a mediation analysis as well to see how much of the effect of psilocybin and anxiolytic antidepressant effects at seven weeks was due to MEQ, and there was partial mediation. So there's something going on about these mystical experiences. But again, as Alex said, it's like kind of a black box, and it doesn't explain all the variants. There's other things going on. So people appear to be getting better, but we still don't know why exactly. And at Hopkins, very similar trial. They had a bigger N of 51, crossover at five weeks. They used psilocybin, same dose as us, but their, their control was low-dose psilocybin, and they had no SAEs. Um, same safety data, cardiovascularly, and you've seen this from Matt. The, their, the first time point they measured after psilocybin was five weeks, so they were able to show that there was a difference there, and after the crossover, it had normalized. Uh, both the, the placebo group had gone down to where the experimental group, and you see these for these depression measures, anxiety measures, and they uh, increase quality of life like us and increase death acceptance. So there's something going on with improving the death domain. And similar to ours, they found, this is five weeks after, um, response 
uh, antidepressant response and antidepressant remission rates. So it's similar to find about 80% of people are responding um, and are in uh, remission from anxiety and, and depression. Uh, they also found highly significant experiences. Um, you know, they found that the high dose group, about 62 uh, percent said it was one of the most significant experiences of their lives. So, um, very similar to what we found in terms of the significance of it. Okay, so in summary, we were able to establish that you can do this safely. Um, there are no major SAEs. It's feasible. We found that psilocybin, and this is putting all of them together, UCLA, NYU, Hopkins, that psilocybin is a rapidly acting anxiolytic and antidepressant. It has sustained effects at least seven weeks, but maybe up to six months or even longer than that. Um, it can also affect this existential distress domain, improve quality of life, can improve attitudes around death. The mystical experience seems to be mediating some of the therapeutic effects. Uh, we even found an increase in altruism. Okay, so what's next? Um, what's next is, um, is the FDA said this is really interesting, but cancer-related distress is not really a psychiatric diagnosis. Why don't you move in the direction of depression? And so, uh, you know, they said that affects 10% of the population. It's a big public health menace. So the USONA group is sort of moving in that direction. The cancer work, unfortunately, has sort of died down. For now, we need to reprise that. There's a group, Compass, that's working in Europe. So there's now uh, a movement to use psilocybin to treat major depression, which is different than what we did, but this is what's moving very more, more quickly to, to a shift in making it available. Uh, but this is my prediction. I'm going to end with this, that ketamine is a Schedule three drug. Ketamine will be approved by Janssen as ketamine. It'll be the first psychedelic available as a medicine for a psychiatric disorder. Uh, the MDMA stuff is moving pretty quickly. Rick Doblin says 2021. I would believe him because Rick is very successful. And I would think three to four years we can complete the studies in four to five years. So I think in about four or five years, psychiatry will be radically different. You will have the ability to use these, these compounds um, the MDMA and psilocybin, I think you're only going to be able to use in designated psychedelic clinics. I think you're going to need training to be able to do it. You have to be very careful. This is not go to the local pharmacy and go home and take it. This is, you know, medication-assisted treatment in a medical setting. And you probably, when they're rescheduled, have these holistic, integrated mental health and wellness centers where you can get a whole host of standard treatments for psychiatric addictive disorders, alternative therapies, flotation tanks, um, you know, and then if need be all the way up to using psilocybin, MDMA, and, and ketamine. And uh, so a lot of people to, to thank here. This is our experimental laboratory. Um, this is Michael Bogenschutz here sitting for the session. And that's our team. Um, so I wanted to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Stephen. Those are some very interesting clinical data.